What is it that connects them all together? So just a few days ago on Monday, we talked about the secret origin of everything, and we were talking about Kabbalah and Gnosticism and Neoplatonism and even modern physics and science and seeing how these all connect together and how they're all actually talking about the same thing. Today, we're following that thread even further by seeing what connects all all religions together, that underlying truth, that underlying thread that unites them all. And this is extremely important because we have the power to transform religion into a system that is extremely dogmatic and leads to fanaticism and a lot of hate in the world. I have to choose my words very carefully on YouTube because certain words will trigger the algorithm. But you know what I mean. There's a lot of terrible things going on in the world in the name of religion. Recognizing this underlying truth will solve that. So that's what we're talking about. Now, we're going to be taking a look. Like I said, this has to do with, I know it sounds kind of wild, but it does. It has to do with secret societies and the manipulation of consciousness. To understand why that is, we're going to be taking a look at some of the highest ranking Freemasons, 33rd degree Freemasons, and what they have written about this. And you're going to see exactly what I mean. This is very interesting, and I'm just going to start right, get right into it. And as we go along, pieces will fall together and it'll start to make sense. So the first thing that we are going to look at here is an excerpt by a book known as, and some of you may have heard of this, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Now, The Secret Teachings of All Ages is a book written by Manly P. Hall, who is a 33rd degree Freemason. It's one of, uh, you can't see it, but it's one of my books um, on the... uh, on my shelves back there. It's it's unfortunately obscured by me, but but it's back there. It's um, a an extremely vast volume that describes different secret societies and movements throughout history and how they have shaped consciousness to a certain degree. So we are going to be reading an excerpt from this. Let let's just let's just start and you'll see where we're where I'm going with this, okay? So when confront, so the, the title of this particular aspect that we're looking at here is The Ancient Mysteries and Secret Societies. And it says, when confronted with a problem involving the use of the reasoning faculties, individuals of strong intellect keep their poise and seek to re- re- reach a resolution by obtaining facts and bearing upon the question. Those of immature mentality, on the other hand, when similar con- similarly are confronted, they are overwhelmed. Okay. What is it what does that have to do with anything that we're talking about? What are they talking about? They're basically saying, hey, when people are confronted with a problem that requires them to use reason and analysis, those of strong intellect are able to do so. However, those of the weak intellect are overwhelmed. So Right off the bat, things I want you to note here is that we're talking about, in terms of Manly P. Hall and his definitions, two types of individuals, strong-willed individuals and weak-willed individuals. Strong-willed individuals, according to, or or strong-minded individuals, rather than strong-minded individuals, are those who are able to understand things through their rational faculties, and... uh, the weak individuals are those who, or of an immature mentality, as, as he says, are overwhelmed by this. Okay? So, it says, while the former may be qualified to solve the riddle of their own destiny, the latter must be led like a flock of sheep and taught in simple language. So, I want to tell you right now, here is my problem with a lot of secret societies and occult systems they claim to have secret knowledge because a lot of them of are of this mentality where they see humanity a large portion of humanity as being weak and dumb and stupid so they essentially have to be told a fake story and the real truth is reserved for the those of the strong intellect and the ones who are too dumb to understand it have to be led like sheep. 
I, I find this mentality to be absolutely toxic. I do not like this at all, especially coming from a strict Christian household and being conditioned and brainwashed into religion. The idea of giving people a false narrative to ensnare their mind and ensnare their consciousness, but of course, according to these individuals, they don't look at themselves as ensnaring minds or ensnaring consciousnesses. They look at themselves as being the good shepherd who are leading the sheep. And I, I do not like this uh, mentality at all. So, let's, let's get into this further. It says, they depend almost entirely upon the ministrations of the shepherd. The Apostle Paul said that these little ones must be fed with milk, but that meat is the food of strong men. Thoughtlessness is almost synonymous with childishness, ishness, while thoughtfulness is a symbolic of maturity. So he's referencing the Apostle Paul here, who says the little ones must be fed with milk, but that meat is food for strong men. This idea that those who aren't capable of understanding have to be fed basically like watered down information and and the true meat like the true information is reserved for those who who can handle it once again not a fan of this and not a fan of the fact that the apostle paul is being used to be a sort of symbol of morality here when the apostle paul was an individual who originally hunted down christians and then converted and absolutely changed and altered Christianity and had a lot of sexist ideas and um, a lot of constrictive ideas that were not beneficial at all. So, this idea is is one that I, I do not agree with. And the reason why we're talking about this and the reason why that this is important, because we're talking about here two types of information. Information that is given to the weak-minded masses, and the true information that is reserved for those who can understand it. And we're going to see that this ties into the development of religions, which are stories for the weak-minded public, but beneath it, the true information is reserved for those who can understand it. Now, on the outside, some might think that, oh, well, this kind of makes sense. If people can't understand this stuff, yeah, we got to lead them like a shepherd, but we're really taking care of them. We're, 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 we have their best interest in mind. And that's, of course, what the individuals who support this mindset believe. They look at themselves as being the masters and guides of humanity, leading humanity, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so... I just, I just, I don't like this mindset at all. I, I, like I said, growing up in a, it's, it's Christian household. It, uh, is not appealing to me whatsoever, but here's the problem, right? Like, even if you think, oh, okay, well maybe that makes some kind of sense. The implement implementation of this is why we have so many problems here today. Look at everything going around in the world right now. All the unaliving, all the wars, all the violence done in the name of religion. Why? Because those stories that were given to people because they were too weak to understand were taken literally and integrated into the mind and believed to be true. And now the world is in, in chaos and bloodshed and hatred and division because of this mindset. Because of reserving the true information for all just the select few and giving the masses this watered down version, well, guess what? The sheep that you gave this watered down version to have become, you know, anim- you know, the creatures that are that are making war with each other now because they believed it was true. Because the good shepherd told them that it was true. Let's let's read further. Let's read further. So there, and by the way, when we talk about secret societies, right, so what are secret societies really? Secret societies are groups of individuals have, who have understood reality in a certain way, and they believe that the world should be run a certain way, and are thus manipulating consciousness such that their vision of the world comes to fruition, And this is often done through the creation of religions. 
creation of religions manipulates consciousness. There are lots of different ways to manipulate consciousness. Religion is a really strong way to do this. And you can look at this, there's a lot of examples of this. Like Mormonism was founded by Joseph Smith, who was a Freemason. And there's a lot of Freemasonic symbols within Mormonism. Shares a lot. And there, there's a lot of religions that were founded by secret societies and birthed from secret societies to manipulate consciousness in some form or another. So, and I always want to be very clear. Right? The information on my channel, I'm opposed to this kind of mindset. That's why the information on my channel is not about, like, oh, well, only if you attain the 11th degree of the Grand Master of the arch rays of the beautifying sun, only then can you know the truth of existence. No, the truth is that we all have the truth inside of us, and we can all access it, and I just want people to be able to have the tools to do that, and to choose, to have the choice, to have the choice before them. And if this, so here's the thing, if this information is too hard for some people, well, it's their choice. Give people a choice. Give people, you know, sort of like the red pill or the blue pill. Give people a choice. If they don't want to know, they don't have to. And most people who supposedly aren't ready for this or whatever, they're not interested in this kind of stuff. But give people a choice. Make this information accessible. Make this information accessible. Give people a choice. Show that these stories and religions are false so that we can begin to build a new world and heal from all the chaos and corruption done from all this manipulation that's ultimately based on ego and power trips and people wanting to rule the world. So let's continue here. And and by the way, I'm not totally saying that Manly P. Hall or anything was a terrible person. I don't know much about Manly P. Hall. I like some of his work. I think we should always be careful with reading. I, I don't agree with everything in his work. I, I don't agree with uh, everything in anyone's work. So I just want to you know point that out. I, right now, am criticizing the institutions that manipulate consciousness. Uh, when it comes to Manly P. Hall himself, I just want to point out, I don't know much about him. I know his work. I know what he has written about. And that's what we're looking at here today. So we have to be critical. We want to be skeptical. We, we want to remember that we are looking through things through the lens of logic and reason. So, Manly P. Hall continues by saying, there are, however, few mature minds in the world. And thus, it was that the philosophic religious doctrines of the pagans were divided to meet the, meet the needs of these two fundamental groups of human intellect. One philosophic the other incapable of appreciating the deeper mysteries of life. I, I, I find that to be very condescending. I think that it is true that it's rare to find true free thinkers and truly intelligent individuals, and that a lot of people are, for the most part, sleepwalking and just going through life without paying attention to this stuff. But I think that that could change to a large degree if people were giving access to this information. If more people knew or had access to the tools to be able to wake themselves up from the slumbering. So I don't, I, I, I don't, as always, you know, just not a fan of this mindset. I understand the point, but I don't agree with it. It says, to the discerning few were revealed the esoteric. Okay, so esoteric means hidden or secret, basically, right? So, to the discerning few, to those special people, the secrets were revealed, or the esoteric was revealed, or spiritual teachings. While the unqualified many, the masses, received only the literal or exoteric interpretations. So exoteric means outer, where esoteric means inner and hidden and secret. Exoteric means outer for the public. So 
the few were giving the secret information and the vast majority was given the only the literal public interpretations. In order to make simple the great truths of nature and the abstract principles of natural law, the vital forces of the universe were personified, becoming the gods and goddesses of the ancient mythologies. So, what the truth is, is that reality is composed of fundamental forces and energies. But the masses, instead of being taught that, were taught about gods and goddesses as symbols of these forces and energies. And we can see this reflected today. But guess what happened? Everyone decided to unalive each other because they believed that their god was the true god. Not understanding that in all those varied religions, their god is a symbol for the same underlying truth. And so they're destroying each other based on a symbol, based on a lie that has been perpetuated. Now, there is nothing wrong with using stories and narratives to teach things. But you should be explicit that these are stories and narratives. You should be, you should, you know, if you're going to teach someone and say, hey, you know, talk in terms of, like, for example, Satan and Lucifer and Christ as archetypes, Satan could perhaps represent individualism and rebelliousness and dominance and selfishness. Whereas Christ or Lucifer or liberating archetypes represent knowledge and reason and light and c collective love, etc. You want to be explicit that these are symbols and archetypes and don't represent actual events that happened. Now, j just to be clear, I do believe that Jesus Christ actually existed, but I don't believe that he existed as someone who went around and did miracles and was raised from the dead. I believe that Christ was a very enlightened individual who wanted to teach people how to reach a higher consciousness and realize their own divinity and not hurt each other. <laughs> Love thy neighbor as thyself, you know, the golden rule. I believe that that was, was the goal, and this, guess what happened? This got hijacked by a religious narrative and transformed Christ into a symbol of oppression by inverting these teachings and making it be about, oh, how we are all dirty and sinful and flawed, and we must pray and worship Jesus Christ to be able to be saved from our fundamental brokenness, which is the inverse of the truth, where we are not fundamentally broken, we are fundamentally the source of all reality and all existence upon which all depends. We are reality coming to know itself through itself right here and right now. Literally, as people begin to realize this, as, as maybe even you watching this right now starts to realize that, oh, I am part of the universe that's beginning to, oh, understand that I am the universe. And this is the universe coming to consciousness. This is reality coming to consciousness through us. We are the universe. We are existence. So anyway... Here's a story. You have the individuals be given, you know, stories that they can understand and comprehend while the truth is reserved for the select few. In order to make, uh, let's see. Yes, and it's so, okay, so vital forces of the universe were personified, turning them into gods and goddesses of mythologies. While the ignorant multitudes brought their offerings to the altars of Priapus and Pan, Deities that represent the procreative energies, the wise recognized in these marble statues only symbolic concretions of great abstract truth. All right, so you have statues of the statue of the god Pan, and you have the masses that are worshiping Pan and bringing offerings to Pan, where those who understand the true nature of reality understand that these mar this statue of Pan simply represents the procreative force of existence. So Pan represents, according to Manly P. Hall here, the procreative force of existence, 
But the masses interpret it as being an actual being, an actual entity who looked like Pan and behaved in all the different mythologies that, that Pan is associated with. In all cities of the ancient world were temples for public worship and offering. In every community also were philosophers and mystics deeply versed in nature's lore. These individuals were usually banded together, forming seclusive philosophic and religious schools. The more important of these groups were known as the mysteries. Many of the great minds of antiquity were initiated into these secret fraternities by strange and mysterious rites, some of which were extremely cruel. Alexander Wilder, and, and by I, I want to mention this as well, is that like I, I have you know interacted with individuals who have this mindset, this idea of, oh, humanity has to be given like this dumbed down version. Uh, ultimately, what you're doing is you're lying to people. And I can understand if you know it was necessary in the past to to put things in, in these terms or whatever. But especially right now, I mean, I do have, I have contention with even the, the past, but let's just give, you know, put that aside for now. Right now, there, there is no reason to give humanity these false narratives. Can you imagine, like, look, this is, infor- th- this is the most important information in existence. This is information about the nature of reality and yourself that can literally give you the tools to reach the next level of consciousness. This should be taught as straightforwardly as possible. Can you imagine if today in school we approached things like that in the same way? Like, oh, you know what? Most people, they can't handle science. They can't handle mathematics. So we're just going to give them stories. We're gonna just we're just gonna give that we're just gonna make it wrap it up in codes and allegories and stories and metaphors and the smart ones will get it and the dumb ones they're just gonna believe that, that that's true. It's not how you teach things. This is not how allegories are fine if you tell people they're allegories. It's not okay if you teach them as true. And that's what Hypatia of Alexandria was uh, all about. When she said that stories should be start, taught as stories and myths as myths. And she was all about how it corrupts the minds of children. She's like, this corrupts the minds of children when you, when you teach them these stories and, and fantasies and fables. It corrupts the mind. And it absolutely does. Guess what happened? Well, a lot of a Christian mob was not happy. And they skinned her alive. So... And began that Christian mob were the ones who took the stories to be true. It's not a great idea here. This is not this is not how you teach stuff. This is not how you get information across. So Alexander Wilder defines the mysteries as sacred dramas performed at stated periods. The most celebrated were those of Isis, Sabatius, Sibel, and Eloisus. So After being admitted, the initiates were instructed in the secret wisdom that had been prescribed for ages. Plato, an initiate of one of these sacred orders, was severely criticized because in his writings he revealed to the public many of the great secret philosophical principles of the mysteries. So Plato was involved in the Eleusinian mysteries. Plato was involved in basically like secret societies. Okay? And he was an initiate. And he was criticized... Because he was revealing this information to the public in his writings. Well, good. Who gives a... (laughs) Plato is considered one of the greatest philosophers in history. I think it was Bertrand Russell. I'm not sure. Some philosopher, probably Bertrand Russell, said that all of philosophy is just a footnote to Plato. Essentially, everything is a reference to Plato or a response to Plato. Now, I wouldn't go that far. But it shows just how important Plato was to the development of the Western philosophic tradition. And can you imagine if he didn't write half the stuff he wrote because some people with an ego that wanted to keep secrets from themselves were like, ah, nah, you shouldn't, you can't write that. It's ridiculous. And 
Thankfully, he did. And philosophy blossomed because of it. So, what's, what's also very interesting, by the way, as well, is that it is theorized that the Eleusinian Mysteries had a psychedelic experience associated with it in one of their cups or in, in some of their cups used for one of their secret rites was found residue of er- ergot, which is a substance that, uh, uh, a fungus that LSD is derived from or synthesized from in some way. It's involved in the, it's involved in the process of, of deriving LSD ergot. So, so this potentially psychedelic fungus uh, was potentially used in, um, the Eleusinian Mysteries, which means and Plato might have been tripping balls, which is, thankfully he did, uh, if he didn't, did indeed, but it seems very possible that this was highly influential in this philosophy as well. So, it continues by saying, Thomas Taylor has written, man is naturally a religious animal. From the earliest dawning of his consciousness, man has worshipped and revered things as symbolic of the invisible, omnipresent, indescribable thing concerning which he could discover practically nothing. So, this uh, substitution of symbols. It says, in the ancient world, nearly all the secret societies were philosophic and religious. Space prohibits detailed discussion of the secret schools. There were literally scores of these ancient cults with branches in all part of the Eastern and Western world. Some, such as the Pythagoras and Hermeticists, show a decided Oriental influence, while Rosicrucians, according to their own proclamations, gained much of their wisdom from Arabian mystics. Okay, so we have this idea here of, you know, two different types of religions that were created, one that represented actual truth, and one that were literal interpretations given to the masses. Now, this is discussed, and like I said, Manly P. Hall. Now, if we take a look at uh, J.D. Buck here, just to show the correlation, this is another Masonic book known as Mystic Masonry, written by J.D. Buck, another 33rd degree Freemason. Some say 32nd degree, some say 33rd degree. I believe in its in his obituary that says 33rd degree. Anyway, J.D. Buck writes in his book, this is a different individual, I just want to show the correlation here. J.D. Buck writes, In the ancient mysteries and in all of the great religions, there was always an exoteric portion given out to the world, to the uninitiated, and an esoteric portion reserved for the initiate and revealed by degrees according as the candidate demonstrated his fitness to receive, conceal, and rightly use the knowledge so imparted. So if one had to do this in the past because they were afraid of persecution or something, I get it. That's fine. Nowadays, not necessary. Not necessary. If People need to demonstrate that they can learn information. That's that's how schools work. Schools work like that. You take an introductory course. If you pass the test and graduate that course, you take the next one up. And if you graduate from that one, you take the next one up. And you learn higher degrees of knowledge. But it's not this big, oh, well, this is all secret. And we're only going to tell you what it's about if you show that you're worthy and can pass this test. It's just, it's just unnecessary. Totally unnecessary. It's a bunch of ego, uh, power trip, manipulation tactics. That's what it is. In the past, maybe not. In the past, it had a place. People had to be... And, and if one, if one uh, wants to do this to imbue a certain purposefulness in things... One can do that. You can have secrets that are not detrimental. For example, if you just want to have a secret ritual that only, you know, certain people of, of, of who, who have done a certain amount of work get to partake in, that's fine. But withholding, like, actual information, that's, that's the problem. If you just have, like, ooh, this is this, you know, if, if you want to feel cool to have this like secret club or secret handshake or whatever, fine. But when you're actually withholding information from people 
and the world that is critical to humanity's evolution, there's nothing but ego and manipulation there. Previously, like I said, fine, acceptable. Now, there's no reason for it. This information needs to be taught like it's taught in schools. So that humanity can reach the next level of consciousness and we can realize that we're all in this together and start building a beautiful new world right here and right now. So, J.D. Book continues by saying, Few professed Christians are perhaps aware that such was the case with Christianity during the first two or three centuries. The following quote from Albert Pike's great work may therefore be of interest. Quote, this in its purity, as taught by Christ himself, was the true religion, as communicated by God. It is no new religion, but the reproduction of the oldest of all, and is true and perfect morality is the morality of masonry, as it is the morality of every creed of antiquity. So, what this quote is saying is that Christ communicated the truth. And this truth wasn't new. It was the oldest truth of all, the most fundamental truth of all, and is the truth of every creed in antiquity, basically. St. Augustine says, what is now called the Christian religion existed among the ancients and was not absent from the human race until Christ come came, from which time the true religion, which existed already, began to be called Christian. All right, so there's a lot more that we could say here. I'm just looking at the time. There's a lot uh, here. There's a lot of information here. If you guys want to read this, check it out. Check out The Secret uh, Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall and The Mystic Masonry by J.D. Buck. Always be careful when reading. I always say, be careful when reading anything that's occult or esoteric because it, it can be a lot of allegories and metaphors, and sometimes it can be hard to discern what is real and what is not real. And quite often, some of these texts will be manipulative as well. Um, some, some, some of them will be written by individuals with intentions that are nefarious, and so they may slip in things in there to, as like, conditioning tactics or brainwashing tactics or whatever. So just be careful. Be cognizant when exploring this kind of stuff. You know, always use logic. Always use reason. Always think for yourself. Make sure that it aligns with, with truth and critical thinking, etc. So I want to pull this together now. All right. So we're talking about the secret truth that underlies all religion, all religion. So what is that secret truth, right? We're talking about, oh, well, there's a secret truth that was told to different initiates and then all religions are basically just representatives of those truths. Now, I want to read real quick a little highlight from an article here called What Every Religion Hides at Its Core, A divine, a Dive into Jung's Truth. So, this is on Medium.com and written by Thomas A. Vick. So, check out Thomas A. Vick on Medium.com if you like some of this, what I'm about to read. But I want to explain this because Thomas Vick had an experience that mirrors what we're talking about here. And... He quotes a quote by Carl Jung, and Carl Jung is, is, is amazing, fantastic Swiss psychiatrist and psychologist. So, Carl Jung says, it's erroneous to believe that religions differ in their innermost essence. Strictly speaking, it's always one and the same religion. So, Carl Jung is basically saying, it's wrong to think that in their inner core, religions are different. Because strictly speaking, it's the one and same religion. So what's this mean? What's this talking about? So Carl Jung was very much into understanding archetypal symbolism and how humans communicate ideas through stories and metaphors. And he studied all kinds of mystery schools and secret societies. So he studied alchemy. He studied Gnosticism. Uh, he studied uh, astrology. He studied all these systems, but he didn't take them as being literal truth. He didn't believe, like in Gnosticism, that Yaldabaoth, the Demiurge, created the world to trap human souls. He believed that, well, a Jungian interpretation of this would be that the Demiurge or Yaldabaoth represents the ego. 
as something to overcome. And alchemy, he didn't believe it was about, or he didn't interpret it as, or he didn't believe himself that one could turn metal into gold by studying alchemy. He believed that it was representative of purifying the soul. Instead of changing base metal into gold, one is transforming the soul by removing impurities and self-actualizing. Same thing with astrology. Astrology, he didn't believe, had anything to do with the planets or the stars, but were archetypal symbols for core personality traits and uh, themes and energies that exist within humanity. Not, not with the planets, not with the stars, but just as archetypal symbols of energetic patterns. But this is a good example. Well, here, first, Carl Jung point is basically sort of like all religions are like this. Just like alchemy shouldn't be interpreted as turning metal into gold, and astrology shouldn't be interpreted as act- the actual planets and stars, and Gnosticism shouldn't be interpreted as an actual evil archon that's uh, trapping souls and whatever. He's saying that these are all symbols and metaphors for the true underlying energetic structures of existence. And this is exactly what Manly P. Hall was saying. This is exactly what uh, Hall was saying, more or less, in the same terms, where his example was Pan representing the procreative force. It's not that the god Pan actually exists. There's a procreative force in nature, and humanity can symbolically understand that procreative force as represented by the god Pan, as a story, as a symbol, as a metaphor. The problem is with religion is when it's taken literally. And here is how we can have the power to transform religion. We can have the power. See, we can't get rid of religion. That's impossible. You can't. You can't just be like, oh, okay, everyone, let's 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 get ri- let's eliminate religion. That's not possible. You can't. Can you imagine how many people would 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 just the 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 amount of of, of violence that would occur from that attempt and even if that occurred it wouldn't be successful it would just cause more people to become uh, zealots and form resistance groups and it would be a mess you can't just forcefully brute force eliminate religion that's not how reality works energy cannot be destroyed it can only be transformed elements of the psyche can't just be eliminated they have to be integrated you can't just eliminate religion. That's the stupid idea. It's an ineffective idea. It's an impossible idea. It's not, it's not possible. What one has to do, like energy, is transform it. And it can be transformed from the inside out. And that's the great thing about it, is because the inner core of all religions have that underlying truth behind it. So it has that core that can transform it from the inside out. Now, this is not an easy process. It's not going to be one that can happen simply and overnight. It's a going to you know take a lot of work but essentially what this is about is about unveiling the inner core that all these religions are based on so that individuals can start to come to the realization that their religions are all allegories symbols and metaphors for an underlying truth that we all share so whether you're talking about Jehovah or the one or Allah or uh Brahman, or, you know, name name any of the other gods. You can understand that these are just cultural and religious and symbolic and allegorical representations of the underlying truth that unites them all together. And it's when they're taking literal, and when it's understand it's metaphorical, then there's no problem. There's no issue. Because you understand that it's just a different... It's like different languages. You understand that, uh, you know, a language in one, a word in one language, an entity, you know, if if there's a cat, you know, you're looking at a cat over there, you have 10 different languages, you all have 10 different words for cat. But you all understand that those words reference that cat. Even though there's 10 different words, cat or gato or whatever, even though there's different words. Neko, I think Neko is cat in Japanese. That's such a cute, that's a cute word, isn't it? Neko. So whether it's Neko or cat, kitty or gato, whatever, you understand that that word, that label references the same thing. 
So same thing with religion. Regardless of the symbols that we're using across different traditions, we can realize, oh, these represent the same underlying truths, the same underlying fabric that can unite us together. So instead of destroying each other because we think that the words are real, we can realize that they signify the under... And, and, and that means we can keep all that symbolism and all that cultural expression. But understanding that it's symbol and allegorical and, and metaphorical with that explicit understanding. And of course, as well, realize that these allegories and stories and metaphors were written at a certain time in history by fallible humans. And so there's a lot of stuff in there that's not good. So all the, you know, homophobic, violent, sexist, misogynist, all that crap, you can, it needs to be realized, oh, well, that was written in different times. This does not apply today. So remove all that. Keep all the allegories and the stories but understand that they explicitly, that they are allegorical and that they are in the form of stories. And this is where we can start to resolve all the problems that were created from these religions. Imagine how, like take alchemy, for example. Imagine the enormous difference that occurs when one takes alchemy to be literal, so you're spending your whole life mixing different elements together, trying to turn metal into gold, but you have faith that you can do it, and you're trying, and you're wasting your life, when really what it's about, it's about transforming the soul, and purifying the soul, and actualizing the self. Well, this is the same idea of someone who wastes their whole life trying to please God, and worship God, and, and, and be a servant of God, when the truth is, is about actualizing yourself. And Jesus said, ye are gods. The message is to be like Jesus means to realize your divinity like Jesus did. That's what being like Jesus actually means. Realize your divine like Jesus. Have the same consciousness that Christ had. And there's not this unbridgeable gap that strips you of your divinity. So you see that just like someone who would waste their life away working on alchemy when it's redundant, but the inner message is what's critical and important. This is what unites humanity together. And so, for example, let's say you have someone that believes in alchemy and uses the symbols of alchemy for about purifying the self. Someone in the Gnostic tradition might talk about it in terms of overcoming archonic forces to attain gnosis. So whether you're talking about removing impurities or overcoming archons, underneath these symbols and metaphors, it means the same thing. To overcome the imperfections in oneself, to become a more integrated and whole individual. And you can talk about it in terms of alchemy, you can talk about it in terms of Gnosticism, you can talk about it in terms of Hermeticism, you can talk about it in terms of Kabbalah, you can talk about it in terms of psychology, but it's all referencing the same fundamental thing. And this is how we are able to transform reality. So you see the difference here is it's an elevation in understanding where one isn't just outright, oh, we need to eliminate religion. That's not possible. You can't do it. But instead, it's about unveiling what is actually there underneath it all so that individuals can don't have to give up all the things that they're attached to, like, you know, their cross jewelry or, uh, you know, the different representations of their gods and goddesses and Kali and Brahman and all that. That's all fine. You can keep all that's great. That's what makes life interesting. All all the different stories and metaphors, all the em emotional elements are are great. They're fantastic. It's 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 you know, it's why people are drawn to these things. It's 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 fulfilling. But as long as they are understood that they represent in an allegorical and metaphorical way, energetic structures of reality. 
And underneath all religion, and I'm looking at this, I, I only read one, one quote from here that was actually just a young quote. So let me, let me just read a couple things here from this person because I, I wanted to. said, I recall my own awakening on October 6th or 16th. On that day, while lounging at my home, a jolt of realization swept over me. The threads connecting the various spiritual and religious teachings suddenly tightened. The essence was the same, only masked in different guises. Just as these tr uh, trees are nourished by the same soil, every religion drinks from the same wellspring of spiritual truth. And he goes on to say, one might argue, but their rituals are different. Their gods have different names. True, but consider at the heart of each religion is like a map guiding the seeker within to a place beyond the veil of names. Dive within, recognize your true self, and you will find the universe there. So a couple things I want to say about this real quick. And the first thing that I want to say about this is, so, okay, do all, all our, is there an underlying truth behind all religions? When understood metaphorically and symbolically? Yes. When taken literally, no, they're about the, as opposite of each other as you can possibly get. You know, Christianity is, is nothing like Hinduism when it's taken literally. And this is what causes all the clashes and conflict. So, it's important to realize that, you know, people think, oh, well, everyone just needs to get along. It has to be explicitly realized, though, people won't get along until it's understood that these are metaphors and allegories. Because they believe that these things are true. With I grew up a Christian, I know this. You believe with all your heart, mind, and soul that God created the universe and that you are a product of sin and have to worship and believe in God or else you will go to hell for eternity. Be tortured for eternity. And you believe that everyone who doesn't believe in God is going to be tortured for eternity. So, of course, what's that going to make one want to do? Well, you're going to want to go out and save people because you don't want people to be tortured for eternity. And now you're bugging everyone. You're, you're knocking on people's doors. You're... you're you know, hating on gay people because you think gay being gay is a sin because this old book said so and all this stuff. It's not, but it follows from literalist beliefs. So when religions are taken to be literally true, they're miles apart and cannot, cannot connect. They are, they are, they are incompatible. They are mutually exclusive. Cannot. But when one looks beneath that layer... And it's realized that one can interpret these stories metaphorically and allegorically while getting rid of all the hateful, outdated BS. This is where we can begin to work on unity and transformation. Where we can begin to respect each other's traditional and cultural expressions as allegories for an underlying true reality. So a Gnostic can talk about the One, and a Hindu can talk about Brahman, etc. But it's the same thing. You don't have to get in a war because the Gnostic says, well, Brahman's actually an archon of the Demiurge, and is trapping, you know, whatever. I don't know. They, they, they don't believe that. I'm just pulling that out of the air as, as an example of, of what could happen if one takes this stuff to be literally true. But if you take this stuff to be allegorically uh, representative of an underlying fundamental truth, and what is that underlying fundamental truth? In that article I read, they said, look within and dis you'll discover the universe. And that's the whole idea. All of this is about looking within and realizing that you and all of us are divine. It's about realizing that we are all interconnected and that God is a symbolic representation and archetype of our true collective self and what we are. So, in Hinduism, particularly Advaita Vedanta, the individual soul must realize that it is Brahman, all reality. And when the individual soul, or the Atman it's called, when the, when the soul... When Atman realizes it is Brahman, it becomes Brahman. In other words, when the soul realizes it is God, it becomes God. 
Gnosis was all about realizing that one was an emanation of the divine light from the one. Kabbalah is about understanding that God is coming to understand itself through us. And likewise, all of these traditions can be interpreted in such a way where we are understood to be uh, intrinsically divine and interconnected. And that's the thing the truth that we all must understand, despite all these different allegories and expressions, the fundamental truth that we must understand is that we are divine and interconnected. Very important. You don't want one, you don't want one without the other. You don't want to think you're divine and not interconnected or else you can become an asshole and be like, I'm God and you all should serve me. A lot of people in the occult and esoteric systems kind of start to go that direction. You also want to understand when you realize, but you re- when you realize we're all interconnected and part of the same system, you realize we're all divine, and it would dumb be dumb for me to hurt you because it's we're we're part of each other. It'd be like stabbing yourself. Why would no? You're not going to do that when you realize this is an interconnected system. But you also want to realize that you have that power. You also want to realize that you know you don't want to be uh, also like. Um, you, you know, there, there's this, this this sort of idea of, well, one has to be super, like, meek and humble and timid and 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 and, and not care about the self at all. Like, anything that has to do with the self is bad. No, that's not the case either. One can be proud of one's accomplishments and one can do things to enhance the self. Because guess what? When you enhance the self, you enhance the collective. The collective is formed by selves. Now, you don't want to enhance the self at the expense of the collective, that is where the problem lies. So it just uh, relies on understanding that there's nothing wrong with enhancing the self when enhancing the self also enhances the collective because you're part of the collective. But if it's at the expense of the self, if you're hurting others, stepping on others, treating people badly to get ahead, then that's a problem. Now you're you're uh, not truly understanding the nature of the interconnected uh, nature of reality. So, anyway, long story short, the truth is, is that we are all, di- these are the two things that need to be understood. We're all divine and interconnected. Now, of course, it's very, a very complex, complex system if you want to dive into the intricacies of all this. But underneath everything, we want to understand that we are divine and interconnected. And this is what Jesus meant by, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself. Love thy neighbor as thyself because thy neighbor is thyself. When you realize that we're interconnected, we're aspects of each other, we're reflections of each other. So, this idea of being able to have this understanding is what will begin the long process, but begin the process of transforming religion and transforming the world. And we can transform everything. This is not, we want to transform religion, we want to transform science, we want to transform politics, we want to transform the world. And all of it is based on the mind, consciousness, understanding, because actions flow from the mind. Everything around you is an idea. Everything was an idea in someone's mind at some point. Everything around you, everything that's created, those are ideas manifest. Everything around you are ideas manifest. Everything is ideas manifest to some degree. And all actions originate in the mind and are expressed Physically. So if we want to change the world, we have to change our minds. No way around it. You can try and force things. It's not going to be sustainable. It's not going to last. It's about changing the mind. And then everything else will flow from that. And we must realize that realization that we're all in this together. That you and me and all of us together, we're on this journey together. And so, at the end of the day, it's not rocket science. At the end of the day, it's, hey, we're all in this together, so let's be nice to each other. Let's help each other. So, you know, and, and, and this simple idea is extremely hard for humanity to grasp and has been mired in so much confusion. But we can change that right now by changing minds, spreading information, talking about stuff like this, helping people understand. And if you're not ready... To do that yet, that's fine. Work on yourself. Work on your understanding. Because remember, the betterment of the self is the betterment of the collective, because you're part of that. And the more that you better yourself, the more better equipped you'll be able to help later. 
So if you're at a stage right now where you're just working on yourself, that's fine. That's great. Please do. Please do. No one works on themselves. Hardly anyone does that. So, so if you're working on yourself, be proud of yourself. Don't think, oh, I'm not doing enough. Be proud of yourself because no one, no one, no one cares. No one, most, most people don't care about working on themselves. So if you're working on yourself, I applaud you. That's amazing. Please continue. So I hope you enjoyed this, my friends. Uh, I have a lot more videos on my channel. Go.